Whenever a grocery delivery comes in, it must be processed and cleared quickly. Now, doing this is a team effort. The liver is particularly important. He uses the basic ingredients to whip up batches of this, that, and the other. And he depends on insulin to help him keep things running smoothly. Now, truth be told, insulin worries about pretty much every nutrient. But getting the sugar delivered is his priority. So, where is the sugar delivered to? Well, all cells need it. Some more than others. But there are only a few cells that actually store it. And insulin manages this distribution process. Now, the biggest sugar cupboards are the muscles. In fact, the vast majority of the sugar that arrives with dinner is taken up by the muscles. So deliveries to the muscles are rather important. In response to insulin signaling, muscles put up their GLUT4 gates and let the sugar in. Some of the sugar they burn to do muscle things, but if they're currently enjoying a little downtime, they will bring the sugar in and assemble it into glycogen. The glycogen will be safely stored away until it's needed. Now, when you're metabolically challenged, this process doesn't always go according to script. The gates are slow to open and the sugar keeps circulating. When it hangs around for longer than it should, you experience a sugar spike. And in the long run, sugar spikes are pretty damaging. Now, there are lots of moving parts to getting the sugar delivered all of which are not working optimally when you're metabolically challenged. But usually the focus is on the production side of things. But delivery is also an issue. And this is what a group of researchers based in Iowa City discovered. Join us for this episode of Better Body Chemistry TV as we explore the challenges insulin faces in making sugar deliveries to muscles and what you can do to help. Better Body Chemistry TV is brought to you by Dr. Sandy, a scientist turned gremlin buster, helping you battle sugar gremlins, heifer lumps, and other health horribles through better body chemistry. Remember, small things can make a big difference to your health. Now, the insight into the significance of the delivery problem came when our team took advantage of new technology to take a look at what was going on inside the forearm muscles. They used a Doppler ultrasound to assess how responsive the blood vessels in the forearm were to signals to dilate. The technique allows them to calculate the forearm vascular conductance, or the FVC for short, which is a measure of how easily the blood moves through. The higher the number, the better. The signal they used was acetylcholine, not nitric oxide. And this is important because both are substances that help blood vessels to dilate. Nitric oxide is intimately associated with insulin and blood flow. Acetylcholine, not so much. Acetylcholine binds to muscarinic receptors. Now, variations of these special receptors are located on all the major organs, in the brain, as well as on blood vessel walls. So what happens when acetylcholine is wishing through the forearm reflects the architecture of the blood network running through the forearms. Now, for the record, acetylcholine would be whooshing around after dinner. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that drives the parasympathetic side of the nervous system. It is released when the vagus nerve is triggered. This happens when you are falling asleep, but it also happens when you eat. In fact, The way students remember what this side of the autonomic nervous system does is they use the acronym REST and DIGEST. 
Now, the vasodilation that acetylcholine triggers happens deep inside the organs, and it complements the nitric oxide-dependent vasodilation and helps to facilitate grocery and insulin deliveries. Now, in this study, our team infused acetylcholine into the forearms of 44 people. 30 of them were officially diabetic and 14 were not, although they were all heavier than ideal <laughs> and the level of glycemic control varied from good to problematic. The team used the HbA1c level of 7 as a cutoff point to decide who had good or bad control. And when they did this, they found that people with poor glycemic control had significantly poorer flow in their forearm. And when they plotted the individual values, they generated this curve. In this graph, only those people with a diagnosis of diabetes have been plotted. The black dots are those considered to be well controlled because their HbA1c is less than 7. And the open dots are considered to be the poorly controlled people because their HbA1c is greater than 7. The pattern is clear. In people with poor glycemic control, the architecture is compromised. It's not just an insulin production problem. Insulin is having problems with deliveries. This research hints that good glycemic control requires good blood flow. To achieve this, you need to get the signaling working between insulin and nitric oxide, but you also need to create the infrastructure. So the question is, well, how do you do this? Blood vessel infrastructure depends on creating signals that spark sustainable blood vessel creation and maintenance. Interestingly enough, the trigger for angiogenesis is oxygen shortages. Now, the technical name for this is hypoxia. So you need oxygen shortage, but it must be a transient or short-term shortage because when shortages go on for a long time, they result in blood vessel loss, not generation. And unfortunately, this is what tends to happen in insulin resistance. One of the factors driving this is an imbalance between insulin and C-peptide ratios. You can watch this video to learn more. But now for the good Good news. <laughs> Creating transient hypoxia is actually relatively easy. Now, the classic way to do this is through exercise, particularly squeezing and stretching and holding exercises. Another option is to play high because at high altitude, oxygen levels are lower. A third option is blood vessel torture. Now, this one is one of my favorite hacks. It's perfect if you are a couch potato. You can watch this video to learn more. So, if you're struggling to keep your sugar levels in check, you need to cut insulin some slack and work on the pipelines so that deliveries are improved. This is not something your diabetes meds are doing. They're typically trying to whip the pancreas into shape. So more insulin is released. But more insulin making sugar deliveries is of limited benefit if the insulin that is unleashed has nowhere to go. Make infrastructure development part of your strategies. And then use a little biology to get the pipes you do have working optimally. Visit the library page on the Better Body Chemistry blog to learn more and begin the journey today to creating better body chemistry and better health. Interested in discovering more ways to create better body chemistry or need a little help getting your body chemistry on track? Visit our website at www.betterbodychemistry.com. And whilst you're there, join the Better Body Chemistry community. So you have the help and support that allows you to apply these science-based tips and strategies. Talking about science, here is the journal article 
I've used to tell today's story. Know someone who is struggling to get those sugar, sugars delivered? Share this video with them so they can work on improving their blood vessel infrastructure. And if this is your first time here, be sure to subscribe to our channel so you catch future episodes of Better Body Chemistry TV. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Remember, small things can make a big difference to your health.